welcome to everyone who is joining us for the vape virtual town hall meeting it's our first ever virtual town hall that we're doing here in the mountain region and we just wanted to invite these wonderful presenters to come and explain about just some of the educational pieces for parents um, for all sorts of people within the community about the dangers of vaping and especially with the youth and so with that um, we welcome the california health collaborative and tobacco control program in addition to the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools with the 2P program, we have Addison here and Alejandra and Exel, and then Harrison with Rim Family Services. And I'm Jesse Rogers with Rim Family Services as well. So um, we'll just jump right in and uh, start with our first presenter. Um, we have a California Health Collaborative and the Tobacco Control Program. And we have Alejandra and Exel that are going to be presenting for us tonight. Hi, thank you, Jesse, for inviting us. So we are happy to join you tonight. Um, so let me go ahead and share my presentation with you all. Um, so give me one second. All right, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so my name is Alejandra Horta Segura, and I am one of the youth coordinators uh, with California Health Collaborative, um, San Bernardino Tobacco Control Program. Um, so a little bit background about us. Um, we are um, the local lead agency here in San Bernardino County, um, and we do have um, two offices, one in the city of San Bernardino, um, and one in the city of Victorville. Um, and we do tobacco prevention and control efforts um, throughout the county. Um, and today we're gonna be talking to you guys a little bit about the um, health effects of tobacco. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, pass it on to Isel so she can go ahead and introduce herself um, and get this presentation started. Hello everyone, my name is Isel Ramirez and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Summer in Dino Office. Um, so, okay, so let's get started. So every year there are 480,000 deaths attributed to tobacco. Tobacco is the leading cause of preventable death. 42,000 deaths are a result to secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke exposure causes lung cancer in adults that have never smoked before. Tobacco kills more Americans than AIDS, alcohol, motor vehicles, homicide, illegal drugs, and suicide combined. Tobacco use contributes to $170 billion in healthcare costs per year. Tobacco is responsible for one out of every five deaths in total and one out of every three cancer deaths. There are more than 7,000 chemicals in tobacco smoke. 250 of those chemicals are known to be harmful and more than 69 are known to cause cancer. For non-smokers, breathing secondhand smoke has immediate harmful effects on the heart and blood vessels. It is estimated that secondhand smoke causes nearly 34,000 premature health disease deaths per year. Secondhand smoke exposure causes more than 8,000 deaths from stroke annually. To emphasize, secondhand smoke causes lung cancer in adults who have never smoked before. There is no safe level of exposure to secondhand smoke. It is important to point out that non-smokers who are exposed to secondhand smoke at home or at work increase their risk of developing lung cancer by 20 to 30 percent. Children who are exposed to secondhand smoke are at an increased risk of ear infections, severe asthma, lung infections, and death from sudden infant death syndrome. Um, and smoking today is no longer just limited um, to cigarettes. Um, all secondhand smoke exposure um, produced by cigarettes, um, electronic cigarettes, uh, vaping devices, um, cigarrillos, and hookah is harmful for your health. Um, it is not just water, harmless water vapor. Um, electronic cigarettes aerosol contains at least um, 10 chemicals on California's uh, Prop 65 list of um, chemicals known to cause cancer, uh, birth defects, and other reproductive harms. Um, so you'll see on the right-hand side um, some of these chemicals, uh, which include uh, nicotine, lead, uh, nickel, formaldehyde, um, cadmium, and benzene. Um, so it is, and even if your teen um, is not a user, uh, but they are around um, others who are using um, these devices, um, it can be really harmful for their health. 
So many know about secondhand smoke, but thirdhand smoke is also very harmful and often not talked about. Thirdhand smoke in chemicals of electronic cigarette vapors and aerosols often remain on surfaces and in dust. Even after the vapor and aerosol is gone, it reacts with other chemicals in the environment to form toxic chemicals and are re-released into the environment. This is very different to common tobacco because one cannot visually see or smell the aerosol unless you see someone vaping. People and pets can be exposed to these potentially harmful chemicals through the respiratory system, ingestions, and through skin exposure. Small children are especially at risk for third-hand smoke exposure because they tend to touch services and put their hands in their mouths. They are more vulnerable due to their sensitive skin. Um, so nicotine doesn't just have an effect on your brain. Um, it can affect all, um, have effects all over your body. Um, so for example, um, using nicotine can make your uh, heart beat faster uh, because it activates your fight or flight response. Um, nicotine can also uh, cause, cause trouble breathing um, and damage it, your lungs um, outside of all the chemicals and toxins in cigarettes. Um, nicotine can also cause you to have an increased acid reflux um, and it could be uh, potentially dangerous for those who have diabetes um, because it can cause insulin resistance. Uh, but not only that, it can also um, cause uh, reproductive um, harm on your organs. Um, so the reaction on the nicotine in the brain. Um, so as we know, um, the brain doesn't fully develop till the age of 25, uh, which is alarming because most of the youth who are using are under the age of 25. Um, so we know that it is causing um, harm on their brains. Um, so the reaction of the nicotine um, results in the stimulation of pleasure centers in the brain. Um, so when inhaled, um, nicotine enters into the brain um, after passing through the lungs. Um, then it binds to pleasure receptors um, in the brain that causes the release of pleasure chemicals um, known as dopamine, uh, providing the user with a temporary feeling of pleasure. Um, nicotine is a drug that is a stimulant, um, so meaning it, it raises the levels of uh, physical or psychological activity in the body, um, and it is toxic at high doses. Um, it is a highly addictive uh, since it causes changes in the brain um, chemistry quickly, um, and it leaves the brain craving more. Um, so this means that the user has a hard time um, creating natural uh, feelings of pleasure without the nicotine, um, and the user needs the nicotine just to feel normal. Another um, health effect that we like to talk about is popcorn lung. Oh, so diacetyl and a closely related compound um, cause uh, popcorn lung, also known as constrictive uh, bron bronchiolitis uh, obliterans. Uh, so this is an irreversible uh, respiratory disease uh, that was named after some factory workers um, inhaled artificial butter uh, flavor while working, um, ca causing the small airways in the lungs to become um, irreversibly scarred um, and constricted, um, impairing their breathing. Uh, diacetyl has been found in many of the e-liquids, uh, which our next presenter is going to touch base on. Um, and you'll know how e-liquids are used in some of these devices. Um, and something more of recent as in 2019 uh, with the vaping lung illness, um, it was a sudden and severe um, lung illness from vaping affected, that affected over a thousand people in the U.S. Uh, so it became a public health crisis um, and many of you may have seen um, some of these cases on TV or heard of them. Uh, so all patients were either hospitalized with tr treatments that included uh, medically induced comas, um, breathing machines, um, and other life-supporting measures. Um, there was a reported uh, 2,801 cases throughout the U.S., um, and including more than 200 cases here in California, um, which resulted in 68 deaths. Um, nationwide, um, and five were confirmed here in the U.S. Uh, so some of the symptoms that were reported were cough, um, shortness of breath or chest pain, um, nausea, vomiting, um, abdominal pain or diarrhea, 
uh, fatigue, fever, or unexplained uh, weight loss. Um, so if you have uh, any more questions or would like um, additional information, you can visit babeoutbreak.org uh, for more information. Um, and we also wanted to talk about uh, more recent in the news with COVID-19. Um, so because the virus that causes uh, COVID-19 affects the lungs, um, COVID-19 could be especially a serious issue for people who smoke or vape. Um, smoking and vaping, uh, whether it is tobacco or marijuana, um, lowers the ability to fight off infections, um, and users are more likely to have a worse outcome. Um, when they get an infection. Um, so it's important if you know of anyone who wants to quit. Uh, I know that the state is pushing for 1-800-NO-BUTS. Uh, they are offering free patches to those who qualify. Um, so if you would like more information on resources either with um, the patches or more uh, to locally to, your, to, to serve you, um, you can go ahead and just reach out to us. Um, and we'll go ahead and send you these resources with more information. Um, or if you want to get involved in your community, um, just feel free to reach out to us. We work throughout the county, like I mentioned. Um, so we work in different communities uh, doing different things. Um, so here's my email along with these cells. Um, so this concludes our presentation. Um, thank you, Jesse. I'll go ahead and send it back to you. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate all the information that you guys provided. And for those of you that are attending, if you have any questions during this time, uh, we encourage you to write those down and then we're gonna have a question and answer time right after my presentation. And so you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, you should have a Q&A button. And so you can submit those questions and then we'll review them and hopefully be able to answer those for you as well. And so with that, I'm gonna hand over the presentation to Mr. Addison with the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools. All right, thank you, Jesse. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my uh, presentation here. Okay, uh, one second. Okay, can, can we all see my uh, presentation? Awesome. Well, thank you, Jesse, uh, for having me here today. And uh, Alejandro Nicel, uh, thank you so much for presenting before me. You made it easy for me because you covered some of the topics that that um, that you know I can. I'm not really going to elaborate on because I think what what the the information that you provided is especially important to know as far as the how the health impacts or what the health impacts are to using these products, right? So what I'm going to be here talking about today is a little bit more about what to look for. What do these products look like? Um, and why are we seeing youth use them? So now that we know exactly how uh, really how unhealthy these products are and what they do to the body, what we're gonna do is walk through is what you should look for, how you can spot some of these products and why vape, vaping products and even some other tobacco products are problematic. So um, just real quick, wanted to take a step back. This data, I need to give a shout out to my friends here at the California Health Collaborative because they are the ones who um, make sure that we are able here at this county to be able to receive this wonderful data. So this data comes from the California Student Tobacco Survey. Um, it's administered by the, by the University of California, San Diego, but it's really overseen and um, really brought to us by funds from the California Health Collaborative through um, their uh, designation as a local lead agency. So thank you. Um, so this information here uh, is really important just because we wanted to share, the, and, and this report comes from the 2017-2018 uh, report, since that is the most current one up until now. Um, but we, what we want to show is that we're finding that youth, uh, there are high levels of, of youth uh, use, and especially in high school. So what we've seen is you'll see the bars that are in blue and then the ones that are in green. Well, your blue bars, those are your ones that are showing have youth ever use these products any times in their lives, right? Um, and then the ones that we're seeing with the, uh, the ones that we're seeing with the uh, green bars are the ones that are current use, which means are they have they used these products in the past 30 days. So what we found is that in the past 30 days, almost 12% of high school students currently use a tobacco product. That means that they have used a product within 30 days of this survey being collected. And then what we're seeing is that 10% of those students that answered 
in that 12% category, 10% of them are using e-cigarettes. So that's how we know that this is a huge problem. I know I've heard people say, hey, 10% is not that bad. Well, let's put something into perspective. 10% is 10 students out of every 100. That is a lot of students when you start to think of a, of a high school graduating class or any, uh, any type of high school classroom or um, let's just say a freshman class makes up 400 students. Well, imagine that out of every 400, every 100 students, 10 of those vape. So when you're looking at 400 students, about 40 of those are vaping. So that's insane. That's an incredible number. Um, so I want to give you a quick background as to what are vape products. I know we kind of went over it uh, very briefly in the in the, the previous presentation, but I kind of just want to elaborate a little bit more. So electronic smoking devices are essentially vapes. That's that's uh, ESD is the the scientific term. But what what we're talking about when it comes to vapes, there are various different types of products that are on the market, and they're all named the same thing, right? They're all essentially the same type of product. We go, they go by all these different names that you see that are popping up here. But um, what's most important is want to show you how this, these products have evolved over time, right? When these products first came out, they were intended to look like your traditional cigarettes, as you can see in the picture. But as you go over time, then you can see how the, it's changed to the vape pen. And that's when we start to see the introduction of flavors. Right, so then with the, with the vape pen, that's when we start to see the refillable cartridges where we can start to buy our own flavors um, that, that typically, and, and, and wanna stay almost like 99.99% of the time contain levels of nicotine. And then of course we get over to the, to the mods that you'll see here, but then the one that's the most problematic is the one on the far right, which is Juul. Um, and just as a quick background, Juul has been um, attributed with being the cause of the today's youth vaping epidemic. Um, I know that we don't oftentimes hear about it right now because of COVID-19, but believe uh, me when we say that this is something that, that we're still seeing in schools, even though that is turned virtual, we're still hearing from teachers that this is still a problem. So vapes, uh, um, the jewels, um, again, are one of, the, one of those products that have really created this epidemic and that have be, made it become more attractable to youth. And we'll kind of get into that. But, but um, so want to get into a little bit of the price point, right? So some of these products, the reason why it's important is just because I want to show you how relatively inexpensive with the exception of those mods, those we typically find mostly like adults or young adults using those. Um, but what I want to show is those jewels, the Swarns, and these new puff bars. The reason why I want to share this price is because it's relatively inexpensive to get your hands on one of these things. Now the jewels, they're $64.99. Now that's including the rechargeable battery. And that also includes a couple of jewel pods, right? The pods that you see to, um, next to it, which are the pods that contain the nicotine with flavor. Now the ones that have become to mimic jewel are those puff bars you see on the lower left-hand side. And those have become especially problematic because they are designed to look exactly like Juul. Why? Because they know Juul sells. And number two is that they're disposable. So that makes them a lot cheaper. So they're not intended to be used over and over and over. All they do is they buy this, uh, this uh, product, has a different flavor. As you can see, this one's branded uh, Banana Ice. There are many, many different flavors on the market. You could definitely Google search Puff Bars and you can go on their website and see all the assortment of flavors that they have. Right, so that's what makes it very problematic because it's so inexpensive and it's such so easy for youth to get their hands on. So um, I kind of want to share this slide real quick um, and then just kind of share this. Uh, with the introduction of Juul, we've started to see these products become more youth friendly. We're starting to see uh, something that, that youth are easy, easily able to, to conceal, right? So this is kind of one of the, the big red flags as to why we know the tobacco industry. And when I say tobacco industry, that's because the tobacco industry does have a hand in the vaping industry. So, um, so what we want to show is that, yeah, we know that they're targeting youth. Why? Because they're creating the products that are created to look like youth products that they use every day, right? So real quickly, did you know that these four products were vape products? I mean, maybe to the trained eye and my, on my panelists here, maybe they could have spotted a couple of these right away. Um, but I'll tell you, even me as with someone who's seen many of these products, that one that looks exactly like a pen threw me off because it didn't look like one to me. So what we're, the reason why I want to share this with you is because, again, one of the things that we encourage is don't be, if you're suspicious, don't be afraid to look into these things. If you think your, um, your, your child might, might have some of these products, it's okay to take a look just to, just to confirm. You'll be able to find signs that show that it is not a typical uh, school supply or some type of household product. 
Um, so again, why do we think they're so similar to school supplies? Well, because number one, we know the tobacco industry wants them uh, to start using these products because they know that if they get them early, they become a lifetime customer. Why? Because 80 to 90% of current smokers of traditional tobacco products started before they were 18. So what we're seeing is that it is the, a different product, but the same tactic. And what we're finding here through some studies, and of course these results might vary, right? We, we hear that, sometimes we hear that it could, um, that Juul can be uh, equivalent to one pack of cigarettes. Sometimes we're hearing um, some reports that say as bad as two packs of cigarettes. It really just depends on those different Juul pods, right? So um, what makes this really problematic is because I can agree, and I'm sure everyone on this webinar can agree, that uh, when we hear that, oh, that person smokes a pack a day, we're like, wow, that's a ton of cigarettes. That is smoking 20 cigarettes in a day. That is a ton. Well, what's a lot more problematic with Juul is that that one Juul pod, which is very, very small, is equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. But what we're seeing is that they're not just using one Juul pod, right? They're using multiple Juul pods a day. So I, we've had focus groups with students and they say, no, man, they're, these we're, you know, we have people juuling like a bunch of different pods a day. You know, they all go in on it and, and they're sharing these pods. So we know that they're in, intaking many more um, uh, levels of nicotine than they would have in a pack of cigarettes. And that's why based off of uh, the information that was provided to us in the previous uh, the presentation, that's why it's so problematic because we know how bad nicotine is. Now imagine getting much more nicotine than what a traditional smoker uh, gets. And again, wh why, is, uh, why are we seeing them to be uh, uh, so, uh, why are we seeing youth become so, so uh, interested in these products? Well, we're starting to see flavors, right? They are, there are a ton of flavors on today's market. Would you believe if we said that there are over 15,500 flavors in the market? That is insane. I can't even name 15,500 flavors. But what makes it even more problematic is that we're seeing that these flavors, not only do they sound uh, appealing to youth, but just look at the packaging to them. They, they are very similar. They use the bright colors to the other types of packaging that they would normally want to use. Like if you look at the strawberry shortcake in the front and you look at the strawberry shortcake um, uh, flavoring on the right, they use very similar colors and letterings. And if you look at the, the, uh, the, the products on the left, they look very similar to everyday candies that you can buy at the market. Now, another thing that we want you to be on the lookout is how are they fig finding these products? Well, we know that the tobacco industry no longer puts out commercials, right? We know that they can't do that. We know that they do put it out in, at, our, at the local stores and gas stations, but the biggest way that youth are getting more and more information and that they're listening to rather than, you know, information from us is they're finding this stuff on social media, right? Um, the, all the stuff that they're getting on social media, if you could find some of these hashtags, go ahead and take a look and you're going to see all sorts of different, uh, of, of different results. But yeah, so, uh, social media has been a big reason why the youth vaping epidemic has taken off because they're trying to look this certain image, right? And not only that, their celebrities are doing it as well. So that's another thing. They're, they're looking up to these celebrities that who they look up to are using these products and therefore that's something that they want to get into themselves. So that's something to keep an eye out, right? Is we want to keep an eye on what are these, what are our youth looking at or what are they seeing on social media and what kind of information is being given to them on social media. Um, and of course, I have to talk about real briefly marijuana, right? Um, because we know that there is a relationship between traditional tobacco products and uh, vape products with the use of marijuana. We typically find that users of one of the different, um, each of the different uh, products is usually uh, poly used with another product. For example, a traditional sm cigarette smoker, we're finding more and more data to suggest that they are either vaping at the same time or that they're using marijuana as well. Uh, just as an example, when they roll blunts, when people, when people are using blunts to, to smoke marijuana, they're using a tobacco product to roll that blunt. Um, or for example, if they are using wax or oils, what they're using is they're still using a tobacco product through the vape pen to smoke that marijuana. And then so what we're finding is um, data to show that youth who vape are still three times more likely to go back to traditional products. So this is why it's especially important for us to be able to talk about all three. And I'm not going to get into every single detail, but it does affect the brain. Oftentimes we hear, oh, it's safe, it's natural, it's not addicting. Well, that's false. We're finding that that information is not to be the case. Just as it was mentioned in our presentation before us here, 
Um, THC affects the brain very similarly to the way nicotine does. It, it, it causes that release of dopamine, which eventually through time, the brain will stop developing by itself if marijuana continues to enter the, enter the system. Then the brain realizes, hey, I don't got to create this on my own. I'm going to just ask for this marijuana stuff. It's going to give me my nicotine. And that's how the cycle of addiction starts. But not only that, but it affects the brain, right? So um, the way it affects the brain, uh, as, as, as uh, Alejandra mentioned, the brain doesn't fully develop until the age of 25. And the brain develops from the back to the front. And the final stage that gets developed is the frontal lobe, which is what is, um, gives us as adults um, and youth, it allows us to um, weigh out pros and cons. Uh, we get to think of the consequences. It really makes us, helps us with our decision making, right? It tells us, should I do that? Maybe not. So here's an example of a healthy brain on the left and an unhealthy brain on the right. So the healthy brain, you can see it looks nice and full, plenty of blood flow growing, going through there. And on the right is a one that has used substances and alcohol and it shows those little holes and you'll see that essentially what i want to say is just because you're using marijuana or you use someone you know someone who uses marijuana doesn't mean that they're going to get holes in their brain all that means is that these here these holes signify that there is no blood flow in those areas okay and this is a very uh, a not even a dramatic case i've said dramatic before but really it's not because this is the the scan of an 18 year old with a three-year history so this is someone who started using marijuana when they're 15 years old and only used it four times per week well based off of information that i've talked to with kids they're not just using marijuana four times a week i can tell you that i had one one uh focus group where some students said four times a week you mean four times a day and so i'm like oh whoa whoa so then look at, so imagine if this brain affects someone with four times a week usage imagine with those um, youth or young adults that are using it um, more than four times a day, four times a day right so what what is very problematic is that circle number one like i mentioned the frontal lobe is the last one to be developed and what this is showing is that this person who is 18 years old who's been using it since they were 15 um, essentially has permanently damaged their frontal lobe which is going to affect their decision making abilities later on in life this is what makes it difficult. A quick story that I like to share is when I was 15 years old, I used to go out, I used to go to theme parks like Knott's Berry Farm or Six Flags and get on every single ride. Didn't care, had no regard for what whether I came out of it alive or not. I was gonna eat all the sugar, I was gonna do whatever. Now as an adult, I go to those same exact rides wondering why I'm so afraid to get on them. Well, that's because as an adult, now I'm like, well, you know what? Maybe that's not the safest looking thing to get on. Are you sure you wanna do that? That's just your adult brain now understanding that, hey, maybe we should think about this a little bit. Now, maybe my brain might say, yeah, you know what, we're safe, let's go. But at least my brain weighed those options out. And so that's what a healthy brain can do later on in life. But if, it's if it affects the brain um, early in life, then it's permanently, um, uh, basically you're permanently affected from that. And real quickly, I'm going to just breeze through these because I know I'm getting over on time here. Um, but essentially, what are we here doing through the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools? Well, we just finally were awarded for the first time a tobacco use prevention education grant from the California Department of Public Health. Essentially, what this is going to allow us to do is to implement um, uh, it's going to Im implement uh, comprehensive programs in our schools to be able to work with students. Essentially, as you can see here, these are the different tiers by maintaining tobacco-free certification and collecting this data, implementing classroom-based um, uh, curriculum that, that's evidence-based. And then of course, how do we empower our youth as leaders to become active in their schools and in their communities to advocate for policies that will reduce this issue? And then of course, providing cessation services to those who need them. Um, and then um, uh, also interventions, alternatives to suspensions to students who are caught. Rather than suspending them, how can we help them realize that, hey, Let's through education, how can we help you make a plan for yourself that under, that makes you make better choices and may, makes you realize that maybe these aren't the things you want to be doing. And then this is our brief timeline. So it's a three-year grand cycle. We're hoping that through the good work that we're going to be doing, and of course, it's great to have wonderful community partners here, like on this panel to help us support us with this work. Um, and that um, we're hoping that if these three years go great and that we continue to um, uh, expand the, the number of schools that we're working with and continue to be rewarded. And quick plug, Bear Valley Unified School District is in our consortium group. So um, if, if any of you parents know um, or are interested in receiving more information, please feel free to reach out to us or you can reach out to Jesse. Jesse's great. She knows how to get it to us um, if, if we need to, to, to work with you. So there, there's great opportunities to work. And then last shameless plug, follow us on Healthy SBCSS. We're trying to build our social media presence. This is where we update 
everything as to what we're doing, what we're planning on doing. Don't be, uh, don't be surprised if you see some pictures from this webinar on there. Uh, so this is, this is just a good opportunity for us to throw the information out there. And it also allows us to market some of our free presentations and workshops that we offer to the community and to some of our uh, community partners as well. So um, here's my contact information. Thank you so much, Jesse, uh, for having us. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, and so I'll go ahead and turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Addison. And correct me if I'm wrong, you guys are also in the RIM Unified School District as well, right? Yeah, so we were in the RIM uh, School District. Uh, just There was just a, a couple of uh, things we ran into that uh, didn't allow it. Just really, um, I think with COVID, I think there was just not enough of a uh, um, manpower essentially there was not enough staff uh, to help uh, facilitate that however they will still be receiving supports from us as needed um, so for any for any school districts that are not um, in our consortium like I mentioned Bear Valley for any school districts that are not in that we will still be providing resources and and some um, opportunities to be involved through some of our events um, because we are also servicing as many schools throughout the county as we can well, thank you so much, Addison. We really appreciate all that information. It was very helpful. Um, and with that, I want to continue on. Uh, before I do that, just as a reminder, though, for those of you that are watching, you um, can always, if you have any questions for any one of the panelists here, um, there is a Q&A option at the bottom of your screen where you can um, submit a question and let us know if you have any of those, and we will do our best to answer, answer those. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. All right, can everyone see that okay? All right, well, welcome for those of you that are watching either here live or even if you're watching this later. Um, I am Jesse Rogers. I'm the Prevention Program Director at RIM Family Services, and we work specifically on environmental prevention. And what that is, is um, the mission of the Environmental Prevention Program is to strive to prevent and reduce the harms related to alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs among youth throughout San Bernardino County through comprehensive environmental prevention strategies that include intentional organizing, media advocacy, applied data and research, and policy and enforcement. And so RIM Family Services, we specifically focus on um, the mountain region from Twin Peaks all the way up to Big Bear. And so we're covering that whole mountain region. Um, we also have several other providers throughout San Bernardino County that we um, collaborate with as well, but we're specifically in the mountains. And so <clears throat> our prevention efforts and campaigns are solely driven by our community coalitions. And in the mountains, we have four. And so on the RIM side, we have our adult coalition, which is the RIM Communities for Youth. We have our youth coalition, which is Crestline Youth. And then we have the Breakthrough Task Force, which is the adult coalition in Big Bear. And then the youth coalition, which is above the influence in Big Bear. And so those are the four different coalitions that we, um, we use pretty much the community voice. And I'll talk a little more about that later, about how you can potentially get involved with one of those coalitions. So some of our efforts with tobacco is we did a minor decoy operation specifically in Big Bear. And um, we did that with the help of the Breakthrough Task Force Coalition, and then also with training from the California Health Collaborative and Tobacco Control Program, who you guys heard from a little bit earlier in our presentation. And with that minor decoy operation, we found that 24% of the stores in Big Bear that sell tobacco did sell to our minor decoy. So that's seven out of 29 stores that sold. And for those of you, I know um, the age used to be 18 and up is how and when you could start purchasing tobacco products. Well, in 2016, that changed and now it's 21 and older. And a lot of parents or people, community members, and even unfortunately some of the stores weren't aware of that or aren't aware of that. And so we wanted to take advantage of this minor decoy operation and um, allow the community um, just some education and, and letting them know, hey, you may not have known, but you have to be 21 now and older to purchase tobacco products. And you should not be selling to anyone that is 21 and younger. Um, and so we also did just a little plug for those that were, um, that didn't sell. We highlighted them in the local newspaper, um, just thanking them for, you know, keeping our community safe and not selling to, 
to minors. And so because of that, and also the unique situation that we have in the mountains and the way that um, we're able to enforce things, being that we have incorporated and unincorporated areas, um, we wanted to try and find a way that we could have the same amount of enforcement across the board um, with places that were in the unincorporated areas that were selling. Um, we were finding that it was just hard to enforce anything and you know, stop them from selling to minors. And so we really wanted to make sure that we could do that. So we are now partnering with the Tobacco Coalition, um, which is San Bernardino, Coalition for Tobacco-Free San Bernardino County is what it is. And um, we're trying to push forward this tobacco retail license. And as a way that we're asking the community to help us is by filling out this online postcard. And what this does is we gather signatures of people throughout the county who are there and they want to support this cause and helping to reduce the sales of tobacco to minors. And then we can bring that to the Board of Supervisors and, and show them that, hey, the community is concerned. Um, you know, we, we just heard all the numbers from Addison of students that are vaping and we want to make sure that that's not happening. We want to make sure that our kids are growing up safe and healthy and um, that we're not aiding to, you know, how they're getting sick or, you know, especially now during COVID, like we've talked about, like having all these things as a part of their lungs and stuff like that um, is not good. And so we want to, we want to be on the prevention side of things. We want to be on the side that's going to help um, to keep them away from these things that are highly addictive. And so if you are watching this and um, you can see that there is the web address here or you can scan the QR that's here as well. Um, and then it's just a quick little form that's on Google Forms and you can fill that out. And then that counts as a signature towards our postcard campaign. And so that's one way that you guys can help in our prevention efforts. Um, in addition to that, if you know that there's sales that are happening in your community and you know that there's specific places that are selling to minors, this is an amazing number. You can call 1-800-5-ASK-FOR-ID. You can report them. I always like to say, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So let's be a squeaky wheel. <laughs> let's help in, again, preventing these students and these kids from getting addicted. And that starts with where are they getting it? And if you know that places are selling, then you want to we want to stop. And so we want to make sure that, you know, let them know. I know, I know Big Bear specifically is, is a high tourist town and they'll have meetings about code enforcement because of, um, you know, tourists that come up and they're making loud noises and they're having parties and, you know, they're on vacation and they want to have fun. But then you have your locals that are like, I want to sleep because I worked yesterday. <laughs> and so they'll call code enforcement over and over and over again until finally somebody comes out. And so we want people to come out and we want these places to stop selling to minors. So I encourage you all to take advantage of this phone number here to where we can try and stop those that are selling to minors. And then lastly, how you guys can help. Um, join a coalition. So we have, again, like I was telling you, we have on the RIM side, we have RIM Communities for Youth. They meet the second Tuesday of every month from 12 to 1. Right now we're meeting online just like this on Zoom. So if you're watching on Zoom, you are already a step ahead of the game. You know how to log on. <laughs> and so, um, and then also for Crestline Youth, they're also meeting on Zoom and they're the second and fourth Monday of every month at 3 p.m. And then the Breakthrough Task Force here in Big Bear, we meet the third Thursday of every month from 12.30 to 1.30 on Zoom. And then Above the Influence actually meets every Wednesday at 2.30 on Zoom. And so if you need information, you can also um, put your email in the chat box and I can make sure to send you um, the proper information for the coalition that you want to get involved in. And so um, you can put your email in the question and answer box in addition to what coalition you're interested in. Or if you're watching this later and you watch it on Facebook or YouTube, you know, you can always email me. My email is jrogers, R-O-G-E-R-S, at rimfamilyservices.org. And so I can send you the proper login information so that you can join one of these coalitions. And, you know, again, our heart is just to see um, kids make smart choices and for them to not have an opportunity 
to have access to these products. And so that is the end of my presentation. And so I'm gonna stop sharing here for a moment. And again, just as a reminder, if you do have any questions, please put that in the Q&A box. And then um, with that, I don't see that we have any questions at the moment, but I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Harrison, who's with Rim Family Services. And we have some videos that we wanna show you from the Escape the Vape video contest. And um, we're really excited about the submissions and um, being that we're close to Halloween, we thought it would be fun to do a video contest of that's kind of like scary. Um, and so one of them is kind of like that, like showing you the dangers of the vape. So Harrison, take it away. My name's Justin. I'm here to talk to you about vaping. Vaping is an epidemic that is plaguing schools all across America. From the perspective of a student, I've seen it everywhere. According to the National Institutes of Health, over 37.5% of seniors have said that they vape. So statistically, if you're in a group of three, one person has probably vaped. Many people just don't believe that vaping is actually bad for you. I told someone that vaping is terrible, and they said, yeah, sure. Despite the advertising of the companies who make this stuff, it's very unhealthy. According to the CDC, over 2,291 hospitalized cases as of December 3rd, 2019, have been possibly linked to vaping. So if you vape, please, try to stop. I know it's hard, it's an addiction and they're hard to break, but you can do it. Alright, so that's the first one. Is that a vape? No. Stop! Vaping is bad for you. True or false? True. Go. Stop. Vaping contains nicotine. True or false? True. Good job. Vaping is harmful to get over. True or false? Uh, false? Wrong answer. No. Not the vape. It's consuming me. Um, well, those were the winning submissions of our Escape the Vape video contest, so they'll be receiving some prizes, and uh, we appreciate that they are um, advocating for escaping the vape. <laughs> so, well, guys, we don't have any questions, um, but I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you, Alejandra, Addison, and Isel for coming out tonight and taking some time out to educate the community about the dangers of vaping, especially for our youth. And so, um, unless you guys have any other questions, I think that's it. All right, guys. Well, I hope you have a wonderful evening. All right, thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Bye. Bye.